Well, welcome. This is our continuing series on getting to know our faculty, and we're really lucky today to have Libby Schroeder with us. Libby, thanks so much for spending a few minutes with us. Absolutely. Really, really great. So we'd like to start with um, where you grew up and um, what caused you to go into medicine and uh, not be editor of a magazine <laughs> or um, president of a bank or something like that. Yeah. Uh, so I grew up outside of Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I announced I was going to be a doctor at the age of five. Um, wow. It was it, I had narrowed it down at the age of five to being a doctor or a Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. No idea why oh. those. That was the other. You, know, you picked the right. right <laughs> yep. But was anyone in your family in nope. medicine? Nope. There's nobody in my family in medicine. Uh, my dad's a banker. My mom wow. had run a series of businesses. Um, I had a oh, great incredible. uncle that was a doctor, but I never yeah. met him in my whole life. But I I had already determined it at that point, and I'm a somewhat determined person, yeah. so I I, st I stuck yeah. to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And um, and so how do you end up at uh, obviously Brown is a is a phenomenal university but um, why Brown over maybe some other college choices? I um, I absolutely was determined to not go to Brown because that's where my mother thought I should go. Okay. Uh, so I was pretty convinced I wanted to stay on the East Coast. I was looking for kind of a mid-sized liberal arts school, um, and Brown fit the bill, so I specifically said no. Um, and I looked at a bunch of other schools like Williams and Tufts, um, and in the end, my mother forced me to go spend a night there, <laughs> and I like immediately fell in love with the campus and the you know the people. Yeah. And it turns out sometimes your mother does know best. There you go. And, <laughs> and especially now, you're pr there are probably some some other little uh, young younger um, younger kids who definitely hear that maybe at least once a week. Yes. That mom knows best, right? I try not to say it, but. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so um, from the time you walked into Brown, you knew you wanted to go to medical school. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I knew I wanted to do international work, so I was an international public health major. Um, yeah. I got to spend some time in Kenya oh, wow. during my training um, and was lucky enough to kind of meld the two heading into the rest of my career. Wow. Isn't that great? Yeah. And, uh, and GW for mm. medical school? I mean for residency? For residency, yep. Yeah. Yep, so I got sucked. I always thought I was going to end up in California, and I made it as far as Michigan for medical school, and then I got sucked back east. Yeah. So, um, but that was great. It was a great experience. Yeah, and I'm I, sorry I missed medical school. So um, how did you like Michigan? I, I loved it. It's one of the reasons we ended up here in the long run. Yeah. Um, but I went out there thinking I was going to be a rural pediatrician, and so wow. I... Uh, was that was my career trajectory until the very last rotation of my third year of medical st school, which was surgery, at which point I realized that I was not meant to be a pediatrician. I was well, meant you, to be a surgeon. But if you didn't have that Midwest experience, we probably wouldn't have been able to convince you to come to Milwaukee. Uh, oh, so most it was, definitely. It was great. And then, uh, so your residency at George Washington. Yep. Um, how, did, how did you like GW, and uh, what prompted you to think about... Um, a career in uh, trauma and acute care surgery. I love GW. It's a small program. Mm -hmm. um, unlike a place like this, it's one building with one set of elevators. Two go up, two go down. That's yeah. it. Um, and so it was a great place to train. We had, you know, kind of the depth and breadth of general surgery and sure. subspecialties, but there were really no fellows, and it was a small. Um, it was a small class. There were only four of us. So. It was a great place to train. Um, I thought I wanted to do everything other than be a trauma surgeon, um, and then fell in love really with critical care, and spent a year doing a critical care fellowship in the middle of my residency, sure. and then realized general surgery plus critical care, the next obvious step was kind of a trauma acute care, uh, yeah. and that was, the, that was the flow of how I ended up if where you, I was. If you weren't a surgeon, um, what was maybe second on the list when you were in medical school? What might have been second? Ugh, was well, there anything second? Usually what I talk about is being a dog walker. Yeah. <laughs> like I would have gone the total opposite direction. Yeah. Just like gone to the park with a bunch of dogs, played fetch, made cash. But I mean, nothing else in medicine. You wouldn't have been maybe infectious disease specialist. Not or really. an ophthalmologist. It was... No, my best friend was an ophthalmologist. Yeah. I thought the eye was really gross. Um. So, so basically, <laughs> just like at five, you were going to be a doctor. 
day two of medical school, you were pretty much going to be a surgeon. Day, well, no, the very end of my third year, uh, yeah. it was when I determined I was going to be a sur uh, I was going to be a surgeon. But then once I figured that out, it was full steam ahead. Full steam ahead. Now I know Dr. Demoya tried to recruit you for about it seemed like five years. <laughs> but probably, it probably was only two or three two or three years. Correct. Um, what was um, w w why did it take so long to finally get you it's, to Milwaukee? It's always it's everyone, my husband's fault. Everyone who's listening to this, <laughs> uh, Dr. Schroeder has had a um, just a great landing. You really have. I don't mean to embarrass you, but you've had a phenomenal landing here, and uh, been such a great success. So, oh, thank you, know, you. Tell your husband if if he had only let you come. You I know. know think I, about I, where I, I could I be mean, by now. Exactly. You would probably have my job. I mean, I mean, or you might be even running the entire <laughs> medical center. It's it, let's <laughs> give me th give me three more years. Um, yeah, no, we I interviewed here. I love the idea of this. My husband is an East Coaster for life as well. Um, yeah. Where did he grow up? He grew up in s the southwestern corner of Virginia on a cattle farm, um, wow. and had actually never been to the Midwest until a year before I interviewed for this job when I took him to Chicago for a weekend, and he. He, the concept of the Midwest, he had a lot of preconceived notions. So it yeah. took me a few years to help dispel all of those fallacies and convince him that this was a good place for us to raise a family and for him to be able to do the work he was doing um, and that it was the right job for me, which I had known all the way along. So, yeah. Oh, it's, I, I can appreciate that. My wife um, is a staunch um, Bostonian and, um, and her, her challenge was going to Houston, Texas. Um, coming Imagine. to Milwaukee from Houston was no big deal at all, but going to Houston that was a that was a little bit of a struggle. Yeah, yeah, it can be a little bit of a change. A change. Um, where do you, where do you think? Uh, obviously, you're in. Maybe we could take one minute to talk about global surgery because you're really interested in that, and um, cover global surgery, and then maybe one or two things that you think will happen in the next five or ten years in the in the field of global surgery to try to help um, bring surgery and medical care to places which are uh, desperately in need. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the main reasons I ended up here was because of the global work going on um, across all the departments at MCW. And to be in a place that has the infrastructure and the support um, has been really quite amazing. Unfortunately, I did arrive just as COVID was doing what COVID did, which made travel um, difficult. But we've been able to continue a lot of the projects regardless um, in a variety of countries like Ethiopia, um, Rwanda, Haiti, uh, Cuba. Um, and in the next five to 10 years, what I see is I think that we are on the the general trend in global surgery is to move much more towards capacity building and infrastructure. So yeah. rather than showing up in these places with the idea that we're going to be the ones operating, it's showing up with the idea that they actually know how to operate. What they need is help figuring out how to do research to answer the questions that they have that are specific to their environment. Um, so teaching research skills, um, trauma systems is a huge sure. piece of it, yeah. and the trauma education basic trauma kind of ATLS, the advanced uh, trauma life support training, um, teaching uh, people how to triage these patients and figure out how to get them on a higher level of care, how to um, prevent death from kind of life, immediately life-threatening injuries. And so that's a lot of the work we're doing. Um, and it's, it's very invigorating, partially because we're empowering them to then go on and do, sure. be completely self-sufficient without it's basically, us. It's basically organizing healthcare so that people there can maximize their efficiency and yep. make the most out of what they have. Yep, showing up with a bunch of fancy suture and mesh to do a few cases is helpful to those patients, but it's not going to move the needle. Move really. the needle. Yeah. And so that's what we're essentially trying to do. Wow, that's great. Last question, what do you like to do outside of, outside of work? And maybe you tell us a little bit more about your family. Uh, I'll start with the second part. So uh, I have a great husband named Marshall who's super supportive and we call him primary parent. And um, I have two kids. So my son Grant is 11 and is a huge basketball player, um, big Bucks fan. That was a big win in terms of moving here. Yeah. Um, and then my daughter is eight. Charlotte, um, and she is a competitive rock climber, so oh, wow. you will often find her scaling 
the house or oh, whatever go. else she yeah, can find. Her, the banister. With her belt and straps. Yeah. And well, she likes to boulder, so she prefers to not be harnessed, and oh, so yeah. I often won't watch. What was that movie with Sylvester Stallone? Then uh, she's right. Uh, uh, cliffhangers. Oh, like yeah. <laughs> exactly. Or the more the one these days that the kids watch is Free Solo, which is the documentary about the oh. guy that climbed the um, d uh, at El Cap. And so she, that's her favorite and movie, that's and she'll watch it. Safety lines. Or Correct. Or We've anything. are encouraging her to not pursue that as a lifelong career. Oh, wow. Um, wow. And then when I'm not here, I'm usually running. So I run okay. a lot. In two weeks, I head out to the. Uh, Grand Canyon to do a 48 mile run. Oh wow, my goodness. Um, through the canyon. Um, so that's what keeps 48 me. 48 miles without stopping. Uh, without stopping. One day, 48 miles. Oh, uh, it's called rim to rim to rim. So you go down the canyon, back up, and then back down and back up um, oh, to your so starting point. So what time point. of the day do you run usually? Uh, usually I'm up at 4.30 to run. Sometimes I run in the evenings. This run will start at about 2 a.m. And do you, uh, do you use a treadmill or do you try to go uh, Sometimes. I'm an, I'm an all-season runner, so like I yeah. did a 50K here in February um, wow. at Kettle Moraine when wow. the starting temperature was negative 20 degrees. It was really stupid, but it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Libby Schroeder, thanks so much. Really great to get to know you a little bit more and to have uh, everyone see a little bit into, you, into what makes you tick and your family and work. Uh, thanks so much. Anytime. Okay. Thanks so much.